welcome everybody to our very important event where we are going to be talking about all things COVID-19, vaccine, and busting myths and lies around, around protecting our communities. My name is Brittany Farrell. I am a public health nurse, an organizer, and a policy associate here at Black to the Future Action Fund. Tonight we have an excellent lineup of speakers. Some of you all may know, some of you all may not. I, I'm super excited to introduce who we have joining us this evening, starting with Dr. Uche Blackstock. Dr. Uche Blackstock is a physician and a thought leader on bias and racism in healthcare. We're gonna make sure that we drop the bios of our speakers in the chat. I will I want to make sure that I do them justice. They do incredible work and um, we want to make sure that you all are able to read all about them. So Dr. Uche Blackstock, she's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity and they partner with healthcare and um, related organizations to address racism in healthcare and to eradicate health inequities. We also have Shalina Davis. Uh, Shalina is a public health social worker by training and liking herself to a community connector and a health equity ambassador. She is the CEO of Louisiana Public Health Institute. And last but definitely not least, we have Kenyon Farrell, who is a writer, editor, and strategist, whose work has long focused on public health and infectious disease with a focus on racial, gender, and economic justice. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. All right, so we only have a limited amount of time this evening, so I don't want to waste too much time on intros. Again, those bios will be in the chat, and we will make sure that we give all of our speakers information at the end of tonight's event. Let's jump right into tonight's program. We want to have a conversation this evening, a conversation about COVID-19 and about how it's impacting our communities but we also want to give you all information um, about the vaccine, um, dispel some of the myths that you all might have heard. And we also want to make sure that we could aid in whatever way you need us to, to inform your decision about how you want to move forward. So I'm going to start by, um, I really want to lift up Dr. Uche's work in Brooklyn, in New York. She was on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic when it first hit last year. That's when I really started following her work and I saw all the incredible work that she had been doing. Um, I'm interested to know, Dr. Uche Blackstock, if you know the community that you, that you serve, if there's a sense of relief now that the vaccine has been developed and is slowly being administered, is there Anything that you're noticing now that's different from when things first hit back in 2020? Well, first, Brittany, thank you so much uh, for having me. And I'm excited to be on this panel along with Kenyon and Shalina. And just, just to give you some background, um, I was working in various urgent care centers in Brooklyn, Brooklyn in central Brooklyn when the pandemic hit uh, last March. And literally in front of my eyes, I saw my patient population shift from from racially, socioeconomically diverse to mostly black and brown patients. Many of them were essential workers working for the MTA, which is, you know, they were subway and bus workers. Also, many of them were uh, uh, grocery store workers. Um, they also were delivery um, persons as well. And so, you know, I started, I noticed this and just given the work that I do around health equity, I, I knew that we were headed into really devastation in terms of the impact of this pandemic on our communities. And so I, I saw people of all different ages coming in, low oxygen le levels, difficulty breathing. It really, um, it was quite traumatic just for me as a healthcare professional. I've never been scared to go to work. I was, I was scared to go to work. I was scared of what was happening to my patients. I was scared of being infected, of taking the virus home to my family and my loved ones. And um, it was also scary because our hospital system was so overwhelmed that I didn't even feel comfortable sending my patients to the, to the emergency department because I didn't know if they went to the emergency department, whether they would get the care that they needed. <laughs> um, and so 
yes, you know, we've gone through many different phases since the spring. The spring was the worst of it here in New York City. Uh, things got better over the summer and then our cases started going up again. But I, what I will say in speaking to my patients about the vaccine, uh, that many of them are very hopeful. I would say that we hear a lot about you know, vaccine hesitancy and I know we'll get more into that, but I also will say that a good proportion of my patients do want the vaccine and see it as um, a sign of hope, a glimmer of hope at the end of a very, very long, long tunnel. And um, I'm happy you know, to address some of the other issues a little bit later. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I wanna spend just a little bit more time talking about like your, you said you had like this concern that sending your patients to the ER, they wouldn't get the care that they deserve. Um, I think as, as a black woman practitioner, um, who is aware of health inequities that our community faces in our current health system. I mean, how did that make you feel? So it was interesting because I had a lot of, unfortunately, patient interactions where I was having these conversations with my patients. That I, I, I even re I remember one was a, an elderly Black man who lived alone and he had, he had fallen at home. And as I was evaluating him, I was like, no, something else is going on. I noticed um, on his lung exam, that it wasn't normal. I had him get an x-ray. It turns out, based on his at chest x-ray, he had COVID. And so his oxygen level was very low. And so we were in this conversation where I said to him, you know, it's not safe for you to go home. I want to call an, an, an ambulance to come pick you up and take you to the ER because I'm worried about what's going to happen if you go home. And mm -hmm. he said to me, you know, I'm not going to go there because I don't think they're going to treat me well. Mm -hmm. And so it hit me that he felt safer going home by himself than to an emergency department. Yeah. Right. And, and that's where we were because the emergency departments were at capacity. People were being cared for in the hallways. Family members couldn't go in with patients. And so I finally convinced him to go to the ER. Yeah. And I, and I remember just in my head being like, I hope everything works out for this man. And I even remember a few weeks later, I had another patient, a young black woman who, I guess she couldn't see me really well underneath all my personal protective equipment, but she was coming in with shortness of breath and she had been diagnosed with COVID a few weeks earlier. And she said, I just wanna make sure you're, you're black because I feel like you're, you, you're going to listen to me. Otherwise, I'm out of here. And I said, don't worry. Yes, <laughs> I'm Black. You know, but, but, that's, but these are the interactions that will never leave my memory from, from last spring where it, we're in a crisis. And even in a crisis, we have to worry about people discriminate, discriminating against us and us getting the best care. Yeah, yeah, that's so real. And we're, I mean, we're even seeing it right now with the, the vaccine and who's getting it and who's not. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but thank you so much for sharing that. I know that when, um, when the pandemic was really hitting New York City very, very hard, um, you know, it was at one point considered to be like one of the biggest hotspots at, at a particular moment uh, last year. Um, and, and I know a lot of people heard about it or were talking about it. Um, what I didn't hear a lot about though is, um, you know, not so much as like the bigger cities like New York, Chicago, LA is like how the pandemic has been affecting folks in the South, you know? And I know uh, Shalina, you are the CEO of um, Louisiana Public Health Institute. I would love if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what was it like, you know, when COVID was, what was the impact of COVID hitting, you know, Louisiana like for you all who are addressing the pandemic in both the rural South and in like these urban centers. And um, also I would love to hear a little bit about now that we have this vaccine um, and it is slowly rolling out, uh, what are you all doing to inform people about the vaccine? Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Brittany, for having me and Black to the Future. 
um, for having me. I'm honored to be on this panel with the rock stars, Dr. Uche and Kenyon. Um, and so, yes, Brittany, uh, the Louisiana Public Health Institute, um, you know, we're a statewide community focused a uh, community focused nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in New Orleans, so an urban center. However, we do work across the state. So in rural areas, you know, suburban, exurban, you know, you name it, we do work in. And we mainly serve community-based organizations um, who serve individual community members. So we do a lot of policy programming and work that way. Um, you know, it was interesting because what you all probably heard, like many people here, when you hear Louisiana, people here in New Orleans, uh, which is an important city in Louisiana. Um, however, a lot of times um, rural areas and other areas in our state get left out of the conversations. And you probably heard, you know, Mardi Gras had hit uh, last year around February uh, time. And we believe that probably was how COVID spread so quickly um, throughout New Orleans and then throughout the rest of the state. So you know, it was an, an interesting time where it was all hands on deck from our state and local health department to really help support, um, you know, getting people the support they needed around COVID-19. And then also you saw, like we saw across the country, um, you know, disproportionately high rates of African-Americans dying from COVID-19, which we got a handle on pretty quickly. Um, but just, you know, high level, we're seeing both in rural and urban centers in our state, you know, many of our community-based partners in Louisiana, you know, have been and are on a journey towards addressing systemic issues that have plagued us throughout our history, where this idea of kind of social determinants of health or non-health related social needs um, or health begins where you work, live, play, and pray is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. However, what we need to begin to do the work is how do we bring this concept to action? If we know health is not just healthcare, and we need to bring health outside of the four walls of a clinic or a hospital, what approaches are we going to provide resources towards to do just that? Um, also, how do our mindsets, sh mindsets shift around true and authentic engagement with community is what we've been reflecting on and thinking through, especially as we um, engage rural communities because you know digital and technology like what we're on today is great. Um, however, it's not the answer for everyone in terms of messaging. So uh, especially in our state like Louisiana, 30% of our population does not have access or the infrastructure for broadband internet. So we thought about alternative strategies. And then on top of that, in terms of just, you know, painting the picture of what's happening here in Louisiana, you know, on top of COVID, our communities have faced ongoing man-made and natural disasters and crises like hurricanes, you know, Delta, Laura, and Zeta. And more recently last week, you know, I know a lot of you probably on the line from like the Midwest, in New York, we are not used to cold. Like today, I think it's 70 degrees outside. The last week it was below freezing and we are just not used to that. Um, and that has continued to threaten our systems that serve our most vulnerable residents. Um, so in terms of a plan right now, like all over the country, our major focus is vaccine distribution. Um, our Louisiana Department of Health, our State Department of Health helps coordinate and manage the supply across systems. And we also, um, and kudos goes to our governor, John Bell Edwards, early on in the pandemic, I believe in March or April, he um, created the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force that is led by, you know, people of Black people, um, you know, one person, Dr. Sandra Brown from Southern University and HBCU down here, and then Dr. Thomas Leviste from Tulane University School of Public Health, um, who uh, in this task force represents over 50 people from communities across the state to not only bring forth strategies to address equity related to COVID-19 testing in the beginning, but now vaccines, but also to bring voices to address the distribution and the hesitancy around the vaccine. Um, and we also have community-based organizations who are stepping up to support. Um, you know, uh, lastly, I would say, you know, we know there are many people who wanna get vaccinated. Um, However, in our state and like others, the supply is right now the issue. So we have a number of people who are on wait list who meet uh, the criteria to be in the priority groups um, because we just don't have enough supply. And the other piece of the plan is that we do know that there are people out there who are hesitant. You know, many black people in our state um, indicated uh, more so that they were hesitant than our, the white people in our state about getting the vaccine. So what we're doing right now is just preparing and disseminating uh, messaging and information to help give Louisianans the information they need to make informed decisions 
and also equipping our trusted messengers like our faith-based leaders, our parents, aunties, uncles, community leaders to share data and information so that they can help support people making um, you know, good decisions. And then one more piece, you know, oh, I read- can, wait, can you slow down a little bit for our interpreter? Oh, sure, Brittany. And then one more piece, I think, because I know many of you on the line are community organizers. You know, we've been exploring opportunities and alternative strategies going door to door um, to help uh, support vaccine dissemination. So I'll stop there. That, yeah, you all are doing really important work. Um, and I think that you're right when you when you open talking about, you know, when we think Louisiana, we think New Orleans. And, you know, I grew up in the South. And so I know how a lot of times, you know, outside of the bigger cities that people tend to know in Southern states, there are rural communities where, you know, sometimes they don't have access to hospitals for miles and miles. And so just thinking about how um, in, a, in such a devastating situation like the COVID-19 pandemic, what that could mean for those communities. So I, I think you all, you know, you all are doing essential work um, and with organizations who are also, who are necessary to make the reach to like really actually help our communities get what they need. Um, it's really powerful. I know that I, I don't hear a lot of conversation around um, how incarcerated people are impacted by, um, you know, the pandemic. I remember when last year, um, during the summer, maybe late spring and summer, there were a few reports that came out uh, that were tracking COVID-19 inside of prisons and jails. But I, I don't know. I just don't think that it's ever really uh, uh, something that we spend as much time talking about as we should, given the conditions inside of these institutions um, that, you know, that the, the conditions are horrible, that they inhumanely cage people in. And so, Kenyon, I wanted to, to bring some of your expertise into this conversation around, um, around incarcerated people and how they're being affected by the pandemic. I know that uh, I was reading one of your articles that you wrote, I believe last October, um, and you said that in order for public health to not ring as meaningless phrase, we need to begin to tackle public health from an abolitionist framework. Um, I really love that. And I would love if you could share uh, with the people what that actually means and why it's necessary given how incarcerated people have been impacted. Sure, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk uh, with my esteemed colleagues uh, and to answer this specific question. So first and foremost, when we talk about, you know, an abolitionist uh, framework and, um, you know, people are becoming more and more used to hearing people talk about prison abolition, I think, over the last couple of years, um, which has been a great development. And I, I like to both talk about the sort of conditions within sort of prisons, jails, policing, the courts, all of those systems, but to also think about what we often talk about as the prison industrial complex. So I like to think about the ways in which the logic of, of policing and surveillance and kind of punitive measures as a response to conflict or difference or crisis or, or even things that we consider harm um, as having kind of pervasive impacts on even institutions and parts of our society that are supposed to be about supporting and helping people, right? And so when we talk about the prison system itself and thinking about public health, um, one of the things that I think that we um, don't talk as much about, I think started to happen because of COVID last year, is the fact that prisons and jails themselves are a major site of, uh, of infectious disease transmission. Whether we're talking about um, uh, you know, COVID-19, viral hepatitis, uh, tuberculosis in some instances, um, you know, spread pretty regularly. We see outbreaks in, in prisons very often. Um, and, and often nobody cares, right? What's, you know, what's happening to people inside or very few people really, really care. And so when I think about um, public health from an abolitionist framework, we have to think about the 
prisons themselves as a kind of root cause of, of epidemics to an extent. Back when I wrote that article, which I should mention was featured uh, at uh, medium.com's uh, vertical level as part of a collection that Colin Kaepernick uh, sponsored about prison abolition. And I wrote the piece about public health and, and prison abolition. Um, but we have to think about the role that prisons play, you know, in, in epidemics. Um, and at that point last year, as I was saying, um, the highest rates of COVID uh, transmissions that were happening when you looked at like 10, I think, or 10 to 20 um, places around the country, they were all prisons and jails and immigrant detention centers in the United States at that point, right? So, um, so we have to think about, you know, the role prisons play in that perspective. But then we also have to think about the ways in which public health itself sometimes also kind of acts police-like, right? And I think we have to, which is one of the things that drives the mistrust. So when we, when people who are lay people hear us in public health talk about, you know, epidemiology as disease surveillance, right? Surveillance, you know, itself, or we talk sometimes about people who, uh, you know, a lot of times you hear in the case of tuberculosis or other diseases, like people who are non-compliant with treatment or though, you know, like those sorts of frameworks that are about, um, you know, uh, kind of punitive ways of thinking about public health. And so we have to really rethink not just how we talk about um, public health systems, but also uh, reimagine them in ways that are uh, more compatible with community needs and that also get them away from um, uh, and also thinking about prisons and jails as themselves sites of, of, of pandemics or epidemics and uh, needing to transform and ultimately abolish them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and you know, tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about vaccines later, but uh, I'm just curious to know, is there any, have you heard of any plans for how they plan to uh, protect folks who are incarcerated from COVID-19? Are there any vaccination plans in place? Or uh, is, is this going to be another fight for us to make sure that folks who are incarcerated have access to the vaccine? Uh, the short answer is yes, it will be another fight. Uh, and it looks different from state to state and even county to county in some uh, perspective. So um, I believe uh, Pennsylvania, for instance, is a state that has a uh, uh, has a plan to um, start vaccinating people in prisons, including prison staff. Um, and I think the state I'm in, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. I think Ohio also has been uh, talking about expanding their, uh, uh, you know, to vaccination programs to people in prison. But again, that's going to vary very differently from state to state. And I think one of the things that's been clear in um, a lot of the um, state rollouts is um, the level of politics that are being played with public health. So, um, you know, in some cases, uh, just, you know, who's who's sort of, you know, on the priority list, right? There's some things that we have made decisions about because of the public health imperative and the science tells us if we vaccinate this group of folks first, it will, you know, uh, go a longer way to saving lives and reducing transmission. And then there are other decisions that are being made that have nothing to do with public health and are just about, uh, you know, vaccinating the people who have the, you know, most access to power, which are pri primarily white folks here in Ohio. You know, there's a new story last week showing that, you know, we're a state that is uh, about 13% um, black and black folks are uh, like in the single digits of percentage of folks who are vaccinated and black folks live all over the state. But, you know, when you're in Cleveland or Columbus or Cincinnati, some of the bigger cities, um, you know, the populations are, you know, 50% black, right, in a lot of cases. So seeing that even in that case, black folks are getting uh, vaccinated less. And also, um, like I said, looking at how different states are having different rules about whether or not either uh, staff who work in prison and jails or, pr or people who are in prison or jails themselves will get vaccinated. Um, is a, it's a state by state uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about our um, undocumented community, undocumented immigrants, I mean, you know that a large majority of our essential workers are, are undocumented immigrants who basically keep this economy running in so many ways. And so um, I know that more recently, as the news was coming out of Los Angeles about how um, communities uh, were being impacted, I wanted to just ask, you know, how 
what is it that we don't know about the severity of the impact of COVID-19 on undocumented people and undocumented communities? Um, and then also, what should our government be doing to provide our undocumented community members support? Around, sure, I'm around glad- Vaccine and otherwise can. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad we're talking about that. I think, you know, obviously, and even having in this this presentation, you know, uh, interpreters, right, in Spanish and and uh, in uh, Haitian Creole is important because uh, Black folks are also immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, right? Whether, you know, from, uh, you know, a range of different um, places around the world who are now living in the United States. And um, I think what we're seeing, um, you know, with immigrants uh, and particularly undocumented folks, um, I, I think are just fear of of showing up to get vaccinated, even if folks are meeting the, you know, uh, age criteria or comorbidity criteria, depending on where you're living. As you know, states are kind of rolling out those, uh, you know, vaccination plans. There is reporting that folks who are undocumented are just fearful for showing up. In those, um, you know, locations, uh, because of of uh, fear of being, uh, you know, arrested and uh, sent to a detention center and deported, um, we certainly were seeing that um, throughout the last year in the, uh, you know, Trump administration, last you know, couple of years of the Trump administration, and so people are still holding on, you know, to those. Uh, I think very founded, you know, fears uh, in, in that respect. And I think one of the other things that happened um, last year in the course of this um, was the um, kind of expose of what was happening inside of, uh, of a immigrant detention center in South Georgia, a black woman, uh, a uh, nurse, I believe, uh, Dawn Wooten, who was a whistleblower in this facility, who, you know, first uh, talked about how, first of all, the staff were not given the proper uh, PPE or materials that they needed to protect themselves. But she also, um, you know, whistle blew on the conditions of the detention center itself, which made it um, very difficult for people. So there was overcrowding, there was unsanitary conditions. People uh, did not have good access to water and um, and food, et cetera, all of which, you know, uh, impacted um, the spread of COVID in that facility. Um, and so I think um, we have to pay both attention to, you know, what's happening to people who are outside of, of, of prisons who are undocumented, but also the people who are uh, in the detention centers, um, you know, as as they're also dealing with the similar kinds of conditions that people in, in other prisons are are dealing with as well, um, and 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 also should say to me, she also talked about in that same scenario some of the forced sterilization. So I think we, you know, we to think about like the the the, the manner of just human rights abuses that happen in prisons, some of which happen through. Uh, you know, uh, the lack of health care or uh, giving, in this case, uh, forcibly sterilizing, uh, you know, undocumented immigrants without their consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, some of, um, you know, some of these abuses and abuse of, you know, Black and Brown bodies and power and um, a lot of the harm that has been caused by public health and, and, and our medical um, system in the past, I think, is what is in so many ways informing the hesitancy that we hear about and some of the mistrust and distrust that we hear about. Um, I think that uh, that the mistrust is valid given our experiences here in this country. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that's not true that's also being shared about um, both COVID, I remember when the pandemic first started last spring, Black people couldn't get COVID. That was what I was hearing from folks. And I'm like, that is so not true. And, and then, you know, social media plays such a huge role in the spread of um, misinformation and, and conspiracies about COVID and the vaccine. I really want us to, I think that we have to acknowledge you know, that um, a lot of harm has been caused to black people and brown people and in our communities. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge what we need right now to protect ourselves and our communities and to push back on some of these, these lies and these conspiracies. Um, 
And so I would like to hear from all of you, uh, just have a candid conversation about, you know, just giving a little bit more context to this hesitancy, right? That we know does exist, but we also know it's a problem of access, but um, giving context to that. And then like really get into some of these myths that we've heard and, and spending uh, some time actually dispelling those, you know, while we have folks here, our audience who are listening, they probably have heard a number of different things about how uh, it might change your DNA or how it's a microchip and it's because the government wants to surveil you and like what might be legitimate concerns, right? But also we just wanna make sure that people are well informed on the facts. So uh, let's start by um, addressing the hesitancy. You know, I, I've heard some of what you said when speaking about the experiences of an undocumented people who have been caged by ICE. Um, and, and there are some similarities to the historical experiences around forced sterilizations and abuses and such. So if we can offer some more context for our viewers, that would be great. Um, so, so I'll just, I'll, oh, are, we, are we talking to Kenyon, Brittany, or oh, anyone? You're from Oh, uh, 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 okay. You know, you know, and I, when I think about, you know, these issues around vaccine hesitancy, uh, especially in our communities, I love just to reframe it as, you know, one of institutional untrustworthiness, like that, that, that's been the history, right? And so I know people like to cite Tuskegee often, um, but, you know, in doing the work that I do with my organization, Advancing Health Equity, part of it is really educating people about sort of the, the extent <laughs> of the mistreatment and, and exploitation. And I have to admit that even myself, um, I did not even learn most of this in medical school. I didn't learn any of it in my residency training. I learned, I learned a lot of it as a practicing physician. So the HeLa cells that I used in my histology class we were given no context for this. This was like in the, in the early 2000s. I didn't learn until I was a practicing physician that these cells were from a young black woman with metastatic cervical cancer um, from Baltimore. A and her cells were taken from her without her consent. And her yeah. family didn't know about it and they were immortalized and, and academic institutions and uh, pharmaceutical companies and Biomedical companies have made millions, if not billions, of dollars off of her of her cells. Uh, you know, and and we talk about J. Marion Sims, the father of gynecology, right? Who experimented on, on, on black women who were enslaved to perfect gynecologic procedures without even using anesthetics, right? And then tying that to today, because I think a lot of times we talk about the history, but it's actually also compounded by ongoing discrimination. That you know, we even have a there's a an article that came out in 2016 that's often quoted. It's out of UVA, so UVA Medical School, where they uh, uh, did a study with medical students and residents and asking them to rate the pain of two patients, one black, one white, and um, the students and the, basically the same scenarios. The only difference was the race of the patients and. Um, consistently the students and the residents underrated the, the black patient's pain and gave them less pain medication. And not only that, but the authors made up um, these false beliefs about black people, like our, we age more slowly, our skin is thicker. And about 50% of the, the students and residents believe that those beliefs were probably are, are partially true. So this is 2016, so I think you know, when we talk about a reckoning with the past, it's also a reckoning um, with the present. And so we need, um, you know, our healthcare institutions, our public health institutions to really have these honest conversations about how our communities were harmed and also continue to be harmed. But we also need to do it in the context of yes, but we also are, we're still being harmed. But, you know, these vaccines, <laughs> they actually are probably the only bit of hope that we have out of this nightmare. Mm, yeah. And, and, and I think it's, it's, we can hold space for all of that. Yep. Yep. And I'm glad you said that because that's what I say a lot is like, we can hold multiple truths. Multiple things can be true at the same time. And I really appreciate you raising um, the part about, you know, what they're teaching clinicians in school, you know, because a lot of the textbooks that people still have 
that they're learning from. I know in nursing school, it has stuff in there about how Black people over-exaggerate our pain. And this is the type of stuff that informs those studies that came out in 2016, right? And so um, it's, it's the actual medical institution and system. It's the institutions that are educating the clinicians that then come out and work in those very same institutions. So I really appreciate you raising that. Kenyon, I believe you were about to say something. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things when, um, you know, it's the kind of issue of Tuskegee syphilis study is raised uh, from, you know, family members and, and friends who are concerned about, you know, COVID-19, et cetera. One of the things that I always have to um, remind people that also seems to be useful in terms of how people think about Tuskegee is also to sort of paint the full picture, because I think it's, it's often kind of captured in shorthand to sort of talk about um, kind of hyper experimentation on black bodies right and and the the you know lack of informed consent obviously uh, that you know quote unquote enrolled uh, folks into this study um, but what I often remind people is that actually in 1942 I believe penicillin was discovered right a, a drug to cure syphilis which you have to take as an injection right as a shot um, but and was widely available by 1945. And yet the study went on for 30 more years and they actively kept uh, folks in Tuskegee who had syphilis from accessing that cure, right? You could get it literally the county next door, right? And so when I, so then talking to folks about one of the things that we have to think about in terms of, uh, of uh, kind of you know, racial justice and sort of racism in medicine and public health is actually more often the lack of access to things that we know work, right? More than it is about hyper experimentation. And then I've talked to people about you know, the laws that were changed after 1973. And then also there are folks like you know, Dr. Blackstock, like Shalina, like myself who are involved. So, Cause I think sometimes like there's we see uh, when we think about like who are kind of like black activists and organizers and social justice, you know, folks or whatever, we think about folks who do work around police brutality in prisons, right? And maybe sometimes around education. We don't, those of us who work in public health um, or in medicine as either providers and our activists or who sit at research tables and, you know, talk about the research and look at research protocols or who write about, you know, research as I do often, et cetera, we're often invisible from like the way the black community sort of sees or, or, or is, thinks about people who are activists, right? And so I think like the more, what's been very exciting for me in COVID is to see more and more black folks who are researchers, who are healthcare journalists, who are public health activists, getting a little bit more kind of like shy, frankly, as like, no, we've been doing this work for years and we can talk about like the way these things work. And so I think, and that has been very helpful, you know, uh, for folks, in, you know, in terms of discussing what's been happening with the COVID. And they'll also point to Kismekia Corbett at, you know, NIAD, right, as one of the people who's responsible, a Black woman who's not even 40 years old, right, who is responsible for helping develop uh, one of the vaccines that's currently in use, right? And so when I talk to Black people in those terms, folks get it and kind of open up a little bit more about the possibility and go from the mistrust. And I also think we have to separate like the sort of hesitancy or quote unquote mistrust and the conspiracy theories. So I think they're slightly different and, mm -hmm. and have to uh, know how you're talking to folks in, that, in those contexts. Yes, yes, very important. And speaking of conspiracies, and I'm just going to just it lies you know some of them are just flat out just like really weird lies about the vaccine let's talk about that so um i want to talk about like what have you all heard i know i named a couple of some of the uh, the more extreme um conspiracies that i've heard about the vaccine but what have you heard and let's spend some time like unearthing the truth around around these things that have been said um, I know that people are concerned about DNA change. This is an mRNA vaccine. I know it's new, but can, can you all speak to how this is not going to happen to you if you get the vaccine? Yeah, Brittany, can I, can I also just say that what has struck me over the last few months is how m many people are more willing to listen to family members, loved ones, friends about the vaccine than from 
healthcare professionals, public health care, public health um, experts. And I don't know, I think that just sort of speaks to the situation that we're, 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 we're in right now, where it's, sometimes it feels like uh, an uphill battle. Um, and so I just want people to be mindful of where they are getting their information from and making sure that definitely is a trusted messenger, but someone who has some expertise um, in that area. Um, definitely one thing that I keep hearing is that, and actually I saw um, actually um, a hip hop artist that I love when I was younger, I saw him tweet this out, but then he deleted it, but he said the vaccine is actually injecting the virus into people. And, um, and and people came down really hard on him and I it actually felt bad about it. So I'm like, no, this is not about shaming him for, for writing this. This is about let's let's educate. And you know, the fact is is that um, not just the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, but the Johnson and Johnson vaccines and AstraZeneca, none, none of these vaccines involve incorporating um, virus DNA or virus genetic material into your own DNA. So I just want to make sure that people understand that that is, absolutely false, that there's no injection of any part of the of coronavirus into um, anyone's body and it's not being incorporated into the DNA. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, I, I don't know if there's any simple way to do it because I know I can't do it, but is there any way that you can explain what mRNA actually is? So, so essentially, well, I see the mRNA is like in, in instructions to the cells. So the mRNA, it's covered in some um, we call lipids, it's like sort of fatty material, it's injected and absorbed by the cell. It goes into the into the muscle cell, not into the nucleus, but into the other parts of the cell, and essentially gives instruction to the cell to make uh, a protein that looks like the spike protein. And the spike protein is, is, on, is what's on the surface of coronaviruses and what allows it to enter uh, human cells. And so essentially your body creates a protein that looks like the virus's uh, spike protein. And in response, your body starts generating antibodies. So these other proteins that essentially neutralize the virus. It's because it thinks it's actually seeing the virus. And then those mRNA instructions, they, they disappear, they disintegrate. They're not even incorporated. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is your body actually thinks it was infected. And so you have a, a very robust immune response, you have a lot of different types of cells that are playing a part, B cells, T cells. A lot of these cells actually remember seeing the spike protein so that if you're ever exposed to the virus in the future, your, your immune, immune system can protect you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for breaking that down. Um, is there anything else that, that you all have heard that we can right now just put it out? I, I wanted to share, you know, being in the deep south and kind of Bible belt, um, you know, I've heard folks indicate that the vaccine is the mark of the beast for the end times. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of the response to that, because obviously we do not want to shame people for that belief, but I think the response to that is, you know, listening and hearing and acknowledging that that's what they believe and, and sharing the information and the science, you know, I look to uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's um, website on the COVID-19 vaccine, which also has links to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that are made available now, um, as well as uh, the state, Louisiana State Department of Health for resources about the vaccine, share that, um, and also share, you know, from, you know, people that I trust, like my father, who is a pharmacist who's received the vaccine as a trusted messenger to also share, and he's also an ordained minister, so I kind of point them in his direction <laughs> to kind of share that. So that's one thing that I've heard um, as a myth that I wanted to put out there. <laughs> um, one other one is, well, it's not so much a myth, but another person that I uh, <laughs> love and respect. And since since Dr. Blackstock didn't mention names, I guess I won't either, but I, I usually will. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it keep it confidential. But it was the there was a post about the uh, well, how come we got this vaccine so fast and we don't have a vaccine yet for HIV and a, a list of other conditions. And I think one of the things that um, I have to kind of point people to is that yes, the development of of the Pfizer Moderna vaccines happened relatively quickly, right? But the kind of technology and the thinking about this was already in place. So um, the I, what I've been sort of telling my friends and, and relatives and stuff is that like, 
when if folks remember when the first SARS happened, right, about 15 years ago in the early 2000s, right, there was a big fear that, and that was that's a, with SARS COVID one, right? We are now the virus we're looking at now, SARS COVID two. The first SARS, there was a big panic in the uh, public health world that we were going to see the same conditions that we're seeing now with SARS COVID-2. That turned out to not be the, the case with that disease. Some people did contract it and did die, but not nothing to the scale that we have now. Then the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome happened, right, which is another coronavirus, right? Another fear that we were gonna have a global pandemic like we're seeing now. And in both cases, um, scientists and, and uh, both, uh, you know, microbiologists and, and hey, Rob, yes, slow down. Slow down a little bit, yeah, Sorry. This, this is important and I won't yeah. get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'll slow it down. I was trying to, to, trying to run through, but I'll, I'll slow down. So again, we, over the last, you know, 15, 17 years or so, because of the first SARS, and, and MERS, which were two coronaviruses that we thought were going to become global pandemics didn't happen. But researchers were warning WHO, the World Health Organization, and uh, basically the globe, that if we don't do something, we're going to see a coronavirus <laughs> that is highly infectious, that is airborne, that we are not going to know how to deal with and is going to kill millions of people. And even though it, after those warnings happened, uh, scientists still continued to do the work, even though they weren't in the headlines or weren't on television, right? Human beings are generally fairly risk averse and definitely governments are and don't like to act you know, proactively. They wait till trauma and drama happens before responding. So when SARS-CoV-2 was discovered um, you know, in late 2019, the scientists who had already been looking at these coronaviruses were already prepared to start moving on it. And uh, the, the MNR, uh, RNA uh, technology was already sort of in some stage of development. And we got very lucky that it only took a year to run clinical trials to show uh, proof that it would at least prevent more disease and then we roll, roll it out. We're looking now at studies to show that uh, it will, uh, you know, or that'll keep people from getting sick, I should say. And now there's some newer studies that are showing that, it, that these uh, uh, vaccines do prevent uh, transmission, more data will come out to sort of prove that. But so I, so that's just one of the myths that like, oh, this must be some conspiracy because it came together too fast when actually scientists have been working on this for about 15 years in different capacities. And we got very lucky that they had actually kept doing the work even when they weren't listened to 15 years ago uh, that we needed to do something. And also, can I just, can I also just add that um, another reason why it was appeared to be developed so fast is because instead of these stages occurring uh, sequentially one after the other, they actually occurred in parallel. So all, all the different steps of the clinical trial. And we also had these collaborations between uh, private entities and, and the federal government where unfortunately you know, billions of dollars went into, these, into this to make sure that it happens as soon as possible. And the third thing is um, the virus was so widespread right, that they were actually able to do the study even quicker. They didn't have to wait to see what would happen if people got infected because everyone was getting infected because our rates of transmission were so high. So, um, and I just want to say to people that I, I know that there is a lot of um, suspicion and doubt that is just, but, you know, these, the, the FDA, when it reviews um, clinical trial data, it probably, of any country in the world, uses the, the strictest standards. And, you know, they comb through this data through thousands of pages. Um, and so I, you know, and when we look at the data that we have so far for Pfizer and Moderna, you know, I would say these vaccines are almost miracles of science. And I know that everyone wants to hear that, but they, they really truly are. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, so I just want people just to sort of sit with that and think about that a little bit. Um, Dr. Blackstock, uh, are you getting the vaccine? Oh, yeah, I, I already got the vaccine. And I, and I will tell you, just like Shalina said before we came on, when I found out that, because I see patients, 
So that's why I was eligible in, in, in the first, in the 1A group. But once I found out that they sent the email saying that you could sign up for your spot, <laughs> I, I was on that phone on hold for like three hours. I was like, I could not get that vaccine quick enough. But, and let me tell you why. The suffering that I saw in my patients, I lost, we lost our neighbor. Um, it, it just, it's, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to run the risk of infecting someone else, infecting my family. I don't want to see human suffering that I, that I saw in my patients. I've, you know, I've, I've been practicing for almost 14 years. Last spring left me shook. Mm -hmm. So when, when I found out there was a, there, there, we were going to have a vaccine and, and the data proved that it was safe and effective, I said, sign me up. Sign me up for that. And then I also talked to my my family and my loved ones and friends. And again, I don't think it's my job to convince them to get the vaccine, but I want to make sure that they have the information that they need to make an informed decision for themselves. And yes, I do want them to get the vaccine. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm not going to be paternalistic about it. Yeah. And even after getting it, it's still important for people to mask and socially distance, right? Oh, so yes. Yeah. So just as Kenyon was saying, you know, right now we don't have full data, although actually there's good data coming out of the UK and Israel suggesting that um, not only does the vaccine prevent severe disease, but it actually probably most likely prevents transmission of the virus. We just need a little bit, a, a few more months to collect data to prove that. So that's why, yeah, that's why we're still going to wear masks. We're still going to physically distance for now, but that's not going to be forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Shalina and King, and I would love to hear from you both if you're comfortable with sharing. Do you plan to get the vaccine or have you gotten it? I plan to get the vaccine when my number rolls up. Um, I'm not a direct care provider or I'm not in the um, priority populations that Louisiana currently is providing the vaccine for. Um, but as soon as my number is hit, um, I will be calling my provider to get my shot. Um, and like, uh, you know, Dr. Uche shared, um, I've been having these conversations with um, family members who are in the pri priority groups um, who are currently on the front lines working in pharmacies or long-term care facilities, aunts and uncles, um, who all of us have hesitancy, even me as a public health provider, you know, uh, before I, you know, received the information from the CDC and heard information about the studies and the effectiveness, I was also hesitant myself about getting the vaccine, but I inform myself and I just feel like, you know, like Dr. Uche, you know, I didn't work on the front lines. However, I've had family members who are my age, whose parents have died. I've lost loved ones. I have made, you know, I can name probably on two, more than two hands, people who have passed who are even as young as in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, in every age group, I believe, um, who have passed from this. And I believe, um, you know, the vaccine can help prevent serious um, illness for now. And we'll see, I think the verdict probably is still out in terms of whether we'll have, it, it'll be like the flu shot where we'll have to get it every year, but I will be getting my vaccine when my number is called. So uh, I am actually uh, a clinical trial participant in uh, the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, which is not um, currently approved in the United States. Uh, it is being used for emergency use in the UK and some other places. Um, and I, I joined, um, became a participant um, back in, Jan well, in January, uh, one, because I just was concerned that um, there, that we needed Black people to be in these studies to, one, um, just provide the, the data that we needed to see with a percentage of African Americans or Black folks in general, you know, uh, and how, you know, folks, uh, you know, the vaccines sort of work to give people some more confidence in, you know, how, um, you know, the vaccines would impact, uh, you know, Black folks if they took them. Um, and also to be able to share with people uh, that process, right? That, um, and, and also to say a lot of times, um, you know, we will hear in our, you know, world of kind of social justice warriors, people talk about uh, Harriet Washington's really fantastic book, Medical Apartheid. And it's usually used as a way to kind of like talk about the history of, of, med of abuse in, in medicine and research and public health on black folks. Um, 
and and she details all of those things. But she also, which people forget to talk about, is a proponent of Black people participating in clinical trials um, for the reasons for the reasons of needing Black people to, um, to for us to study, you know, drugs and vaccines uh, in, in in Black folks in particular. So. Um, I just received uh, about a week and a half ago my second shot, whether I'm in the placebo arm or in the vaccine arm, we shall see. Um, but, you know, I'm going through that process. And I was told um, by my uh, trial site that once my time comes up for the vaccine, you know, that is, you know, will be available probably in the summer, um, you know, for myself um, to call them and, le and let them know. Cause then what they will do is, is what they call unblind me from the study and tell me whether I got the vaccine or I was in the placebo arm and then be able to make a decision about whether, you know, I could I, you know, if I got the vaccine, then, you know, I may be okay and don't need to get, uh, you know, the uh, additional Pfizer or Moderna or whatever, but like that, you know, but, um, but to be able to make a decision, you know, and they'll, they'll let me know at that point, you know, whether I got it or not. So uh, I'm, you know, in that process and willing to talk to folks about what it's like being in a vaccine trial. <laughs> so uh, that's that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, oh, can, I, can, I, can you say something? I just see um, Denise put a comment in the chat about, um, the study, the vaccine trials not being diverse enough. And so I just want to say like definitely Moderna, they actually stopped, they halted the trial so that they can increase diversity. Um, and so actually both Pfizer and Moderna and definitely Johnson and Johnson um, um, have uh, numbers that are pretty representative of the, of the US population in terms of people of color. So I, I don't want people to think that, um, you know, these weren't studied in, in black people or uh, Latinx people, and that also what they saw in the in the data is that there were no differences in how the vaccine responded um, in people based on race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you know um, both of you. Thank you for that. I think it's super important to talk about black people in clinical trials. I know that you know um, there is a lot of exclusion or has been a lot of exclusion in cl clinical trials in the past too along gender lines and 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 you know if you're pregnant or not pregnant and what this does I think is it does leave us without the data it leaves us without a way to actually be able to talk to people about the effectiveness of for example the COVID vaccine in pregnant people you know what I'm saying like at first it was we don't know it probably isn't a good idea and now they're saying that it's safe if 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 pregnant people would have been allowed to be a part of that clinical trial, you know, we would have evidence to be able to make a concrete assessment. Um, I think with the exclusions that the you know the exclusion that has happened in the past and that sometimes still does happen, it it really does it it, it can cause you know a gap in knowledge that will take time for us to be able to actually to fill. And also, can I just say, Brittany, that also there is this, this false narrative that Black people and other people of color don't want to be involved in trials. And actually, what studies have shown is that when you talk to us, explain to us, you know, what the study is about, how it would help you, how it will help your community, that we actually are even more likely than white people to sign up for these trials. And so what that tells us is that it's a matter of, of outreach. Are we making, are we, are, we, are we connecting with people in the community to give them the information that they need to make these decisions? Are we making it easy for them to show up like before work, after hours? Are we providing transportation for them to involve them in these trials? And so I, I think the pandemic was a, hopefully a big wake up call for some of these, um, some of these pharmaceutical companies and thinking about um, about clinical trials and and diversity. That's right. Dr. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I really do think that this experience with this pandemic has really uh, shown a light on the importance of cultural congruence, you know, and the relevance and how you engage Black people around um, around clinical trials and everything else. There, it, it has become very clear. But that is so necessary. Um, Brittany, so there was another, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt again. I just see people have questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the Q&A, sorry. Yeah. And I just want to make sure. You'll make time for it. Um, okay, good. I'm, okay, I'm good. I'm going to wrap it up in just a bit. I just have one more question that I would love to get you all's um, thoughts on. And then we're going to turn it over to my colleague and then we'll take questions, okay? So um, 
the last thing that I would really love to know how, you know, what you all are thinking of it and, and you know, what you all suggest is how the Biden-Harris administration is going to address the discrepancy that exists between the percentage of Black people that are sick with COVID um, and the percentage of Black people who are actually receiving vaccinations. So uh, what do you want to see from our new administration? I can start, uh, Brittany, thanks for that question. Well, I think, and I think some of the questions or comments in the chat are getting at this. We have to appeal to both the heart and to the mind. You know, data and information is fine, but if you don't um, show empathy um, towards people's experiences um, and understanding towards people's experiences, and we're talking about you know, mistrust and um, hesitancy, you have to appeal there first. So I want Biden and Harris to kind of appeal that way. And then secondly, from like a, the mind piece, I think um, a few different things that I've thought about. Um, I think we have to ensure that the current infrastructure that has historically been utilized by our black and brown communities um, in accessible and culturally responsive ways. So in our community, many of our community health centers, rural health centers, um, need to be supported and enhanced. So those people who provide the care um, and are trusted in communities need to be fed the resources and the information. Um, also, I think um, we need to make sure that the process um, to actually sign up to get a vaccine is simple and accessible to all. So both in traditional settings, in clinics and you know, online, however, also making phone lines available, going door to door, um, you know, vaccinating at jobs and workplaces that are outside of clinics. Um, and then lastly, I would say, I think we need to prioritize our frontline workers who are not, uh, who are, well, our physicians have been prioritized and healthcare staff, but we also need to prioritize our frontline front workers who are in grocery stores, you know, pharmacy clerks um, in, you know, long-term care facilities who, uh, maybe our janitorial or custodial staff who uh, may be impacted by this. So those are the few things that I think we need to focus on with the Biden and Harris administration. Thank you. Does any does anyone else want to answer briefly so that we can get to Q and A? Yeah. No. I can, oh. Good. Okay. I'll say quickly um, that to me one of the things, and maybe it's because of my like media and journalism training, is that. Where we have, we've done an amazing job in terms of the development of, that, of the vaccines and the response in that way. Like, obviously there are things that could have happened very differently under the last administration, right? But in terms of just the vaccine development piece has been astounding. But what we're still having problems with is the communication about uh, what's risk, what isn't, uh, what is, you know, the, the, the vaccines, the process, et cetera. So one of the things that's really important to me is that we actually, and I'm, I will be doing this as part of my advocacy. And to be frank, I'm actually literally thinking about going back to school to get a PhD in health communications, because I'm very frustrated with the lack of of any real strategies, like you need real, real data and research to show what are the best strategies to communicate these very complex issues to people, right? And, and so to me, I'm interested in like pushing the CDC and NIH to, to create studies that are looking at what are the kinds of uh, health literacy programs that need to be ongoing and we don't need to wait until people, you know, until we're in a pandemic to then explain to people how vaccines work, right? Or to explain, you know, clinical research, right? And randomized controlled trials or et cetera, right? So I, I want um, more focus on ongoing and in increasing our public health infrastructure to include uh, the kinds of public, you know, education campaigns around uh, you know, vaccines and treatment of a range of different things so that people understand what those things are and not try to back end it in a crisis when, you know, everyone is terrified and hearing a bunch of things on the internet and et cetera. Um, so that for me is a, is a big piece of it is really, uh, you know, want, really wanting the administration to create some, some uh, research funds and then implement some strategies over the long term to really help uh, people explain. Because I would say, you know, it's what I tell my friends all the time is like, it's okay to have whatever misgivings or hesitancy or mistrust that you have, but let's have it with the with the basics of the right information, right? And and you know, and so for me, that's a big focus of, of what what I want the administration to be looking at as well. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And Dr. Blackstock, do you have anything before we move on to Q&A? Oh, I, I think my colleagues basically summed it up very, very well. But the only thing I wanted to say was, um, so my, my sister and I, we actually wrote a piece in Washington Post last week about how we, we think that um, the fixed age cutoffs that are being used um, are actually unfair to Black Americans because of our, our life expectancy. In, in Alabama, the, the majority of counties, um, you know, Black people actually died. The life expectancy uh, was even before the cutoff. So, you know, they didn't even live enough, live long enough to make the cutoff. And so just in thinking about how we were essentially ignoring the toll that systemic racism takes on Black lives and Black bodies, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, weathering, epigenetics. I mean, there's so many different ways that um, systemic race, systemic racism shortens our lives. And I would have really preferred for there to be actually explicit language um, in the prioritization schemes, not just by the Advisory Council for Immunization Practices, but by the states, um, really uh, explicitly um, asking for Black people to receive priority with the vaccine. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Thank you all. This has been so rich. I feel like we need a part two. <laughs> Let's move on to um, Q&A because the chat has been blowing up. The Q&A box is cracking. People want to know things. So um, we have, I'm going to say just eight minutes or so to get to some of these questions. Um, I see a question in here uh, from Carmen. Um, Carmen says, a priest told parishioners that the vaccine had fetal cells from aborted fetuses. How to address that? I don't. I've, I've never, I've never heard that. I did not, um, I don't know. I don't th think that is accurate, um, but happy to, to look that up. But I've never heard that the vaccines contain fetal cells. Yeah, I haven't heard that one either. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, Gillespie says, there is a concern that Black Americans will receive the less effective vaccine, um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, I, I have very strong feelings about that statement. First of all, the, the reason why the, the numbers are different for Johnson & Johnson and the Moderna vaccine is because Johnson & Johnson trial was later in the pandemic and they actually did the trial in South Africa, in Brazil. So we got a chance to see how, the, how people with the variants responded to the vaccine. That was a gift to us. Right, as opposed to uh, Pfizer and Moderna, those studies were done earlier in the pandemic and they weren't done in South Africa and Brazil. The only information we have on them is in, vi is in vitro, in the lab, how they respond to the variants, okay? So what I will say to people is for, to get approval for a vaccine, a vaccine needs to be 50%, has 50% efficacy. Johnson & Johnson has that, Moderna has that, Pfizer has that. All of these vaccines, uh, decrease uh, uh, hospitalization. There's zero hospitalizations and zero deaths with these vaccines. All three of them, and mm -hmm. AstraZeneca in terms of this, the the, the data we have from the UK. So they're all good vaccines. So I don't want their people to think that they are lesser vaccines. If you have an opportunity to get a vaccine, get whatever vaccine is offered to you. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a really good question. Um, we have an anonymous, a question from an anonymous person. Um, access to vaccines is very much controlled by the need to be identified, the need to be identified and count. Hence, once you have to sign up and show ID, how do you, how have you seen or heard this impacting immigrants, regardless of immigration status? And what would be, what would an abolitionist strategy look like to address this issue? Um, well, I think that, first of all, people should not be asked for IDs to sign up for vaccine. I mean, there's ways to verify, you know, first of all, the place in which we are right now where in most places people have to actually register online, they have to get, you know what I mean? So like there's, um, you know, ways to, um, you know, sort of verify if this person is the, you know, person that they say they are, you know, online. Um, I think that what we, so we just should not be be doing that. And certainly in the next few months, as more of that, you know, um, 
as we have more vaccines and they'll be expanding um, the, the list, um, I just think that, yeah, we should not, um, or they'll, you know, be expanding who can, can access it, you know, based on, you know, age or whatever the, the cutoffs will be. Um, but we just shouldn't necessarily be asking people's, you know, necessarily for ID. If a person has to sign up online, what's your name, right? Like, what, I mean, that's the first, first place to start. There's, you know, um, just, I think that's kind of how, how we have to deal with it. And then certainly as, um, we have vaccines that are readily available from most places. Uh, you know, folks will be, if, if we get to the place where people can get it at like their local, you know, pharmacy or whatever, like, you know, you won't necessarily need. And we will also need to put um, specific vaccine uh, access points in places for people for whom may not have uh, IDs or who may, uh, you know, so I think some of the things like here in Ohio, where they're talking about, you know, kind of the, the big, you know, football and basketball stadiums may become, you know, uh, public access sites for vaccines. And maybe it's in those kinds of places where there, once we have enough vaccine to go around where there really won't need to be you know, these kinds of like measures in place that people will be able to just to, to get them. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, question from Sean McBride, we have about two minutes. How can community health centers help the black community and people of color improve their access to better health care and decrease infant mortality, something that Biden mentioned having in our communities? I know that is, uh, yeah. Who, who wants to take that question? Well, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. They basically, Sean McBride wants to know how can community health centers help black people and the black community improve their access to better health and decrease disparities and mortality rates? I mean, I think I can speak a little bit to, I guess, Louisiana. We work in partnership with uh, many of our community health centers across the state. And I believe a start to do this is to have, you know, to offer culturally responsive care, um, both in the walls of the clinic and in how you engage communities that aren't going into the walls of the clinic. And I feel like um, just that community health center model, at least here in New Orleans and across the country, community health centers are in neighborhoods, um, oftentimes in neighborhoods that um, have people who are historically underserved, black and brown communities, um, and they offer that care um, holistically. So many of our community health centers have, uh, you know, physicians, nurse practitioners, social workers, um, you know, community health workers and patient navigators to both address the needs, you know, clinical needs, and then also social needs of the patients they serve. Um, so that's how I'll respond to that question. Thank you. All right, you all. Um, I, I'm gonna um, bring on my colleague Kiana really quickly. We have a COVID relief and recovery plan that we just launched and I want to give an opportunity for her to share a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Hi, everyone. Of, of course, my mother is just bringing the dogs in from a walk. So if you hear them, I apologize. But I'm Kiana Gregory. I'm the political director for the Black to the Future Action Fund. And I first of all, I just want to take a second to appreciate our incredible panelists. I appreciate your expertise and your commitment to equity and to our communities. I wanna thank our audience. You all have been incredible. The questions that you have dropped in the chat tonight, the time that you have given us, it's clear that we're all paying attention to this and we are gonna do everything we can as a collective to make sure our communities uh, come out the other end of this hole. Um, so in addition to some of the, the resources like tonight's event and also some educational materials that we'll be providing on the website, I, I also just wanted to say that we are fighting this on all fronts. Um, last week, we launched two campaign plans. 
One of them, um, we're calling it our Black Mandate. It is essentially our 100 days policy agenda for the Biden-Harris administration. And the second plan was an updated version of our COVID-19 relief and recovery plan for Black America. Both of those are on our website. We will make sure to drop the links in the chat. I hope that when you can, you'll take an opportunity to review them, drop us feedback, let us know what you think. Um, the reality is that I am super excited we have these vaccines. Like Shalina, I will also be in line as soon as it's my turn to take them. But until we get to that point, we understand that our communities really are at a tipping point. You know, 41% of Black businesses have permanently closed. The last figure I saw around Black lives lost was at 60,000 and going up every day. We have millions of people unemployed and we're not going to recover without a bold and aggressive plan from the Biden-Harris administration. And so that's what these campaigns that we launched last week um, are, are aiming to get us. So I just wanted to share some of our top policy priorities and then I wanted to ask you all when you can to take a look at those plans and to help us continue to lift up these messages because we're in conversations with legislators, we're talking to the administration, the conversations are encouraging and they're wonderful, but it makes a difference if we are coming to them speaking with the power of 30 and 40 and 50,000 black folks. Um, in addition to the research and the data that we've collected. So our top policy priorities over the next couple of weeks as this COVID-19 relief and recovery plan that the Biden administration is calling the American Rescue Plan moves through the house are $2,000 monthly checks tied to what's called an auto stabilizer. And all that means is that we would have $2,000 checks until the economy has recovered to pre-pandemic levels. It is enough with the one-time checks. So far, we have gotten $1,800, which is roughly $6 a day, and that's just not enough. You can't keep people fed. We can't keep roofs over our head unless we have money and the certainty of knowing that that money is coming so that people can have a confidence in paying their bills and taking care of business and taking care of their families. We are also asking for the extension of the national moratorium on evictions for both renters and homeowners. Again, tied to an auto stabilizer, it's time out for the arbitrary deadlines. People need certainty. You know, outside of getting the vaccine, one of the only ways to protect ourselves from this virus is to social distance. And people can't do that if they don't have a home to go to. Finally, I think what's sort of most relevant to the conversation we've been having is that we need the resources to ensure that we can have racial equity in vaccine distribution. Uh, some of the latest numbers that I saw are that roughly 6% of the people who have received the vaccine so far are black. That's not enough. We are 13% of the population. We are roughly 30% of the deaths and we are at 6%. And this, this conversation that's happening in the national media around our hesitancy to get the vaccine, certainly that's a factor, but we know that what is really at play is access. And so that's what we are asking the Biden-Harris administration for. And on the screen are just some of the measures that we believe will help us get to racial equity and vaccine distribution. So I'm gonna stop now because I don't wanna, I don't wanna stand in between you all and the experts, but I just wanna appreciate you all again for being with us tonight. And I am co-signing what Brittany said about having a part two. We're gonna do it, it's coming, be on the lookout. Thank you, Kiana. Thank you so much. Yes, I feel like we ran out of time so fast. The conversation was so rich. Um, can our speakers just come back on the camera so I can just thank you for joining us this evening. You all have been excellent. If you all can just show some love to Dr. Uche Blackstock, Kenyon Farrow, and Shalina Davis in the chat, um, we will make sure that we follow up in the email to give uh, everyone 
uh, their handles so you can follow them on social media. We can drop that in the chat right now as well, but you will get it in the follow-up email as, long, as well as websites and all of that stuff so that you can stay on top of the work that they're doing. I want to thank our language interpreters. I want to thank our ASL interpreter, Billy. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Please